We've been studying the book of Acts for I feel like seems like eternity. <laughs> but it's been a great study. God, as we've been studying each chapter, we've been studying verses, God has been showing us not what he just did back then, but what he continues to do today. We've learned about Jesus and how the early church began, how he gave his early disciples a mission and a message. And that message was accompanied by signs, wonders, and miracles. And God is still doing this today. We've seen in this uh, series that people have come for prayer and God has divinely healed them in a moment. When we spoke about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God began to fill people with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. God is still moving today, and many of you, you may be wondering, well, I, I just don't fully understand, and that's okay. God hasn't called us to fully understand the Word of God. We're to study it. We're to really dive into it, but sometimes God just asks us to trust Him in faith. I can't fully understand how we can have a virgin birth. I can't fully understand why the king of this universe had to die on a cross for sin, but I have to trust him and believe him that despite my lack of understanding, God's word is still true. I can't fully understand that when I call on the name of Jesus that I'm saved, that I can't fully understand when I pray and intercede for my children that God is listening and answering and moving, but I can trust him by faith that God's word is true. Amen? Amen. So as we continue our study in the book of Acts, I want to I challenge you, if you got your phone, make sure you look at the app. I stayed up pretty late last night editing sermon notes and adding scripture references, and I'm going to mention some of those things. They won't necessarily be up on the screen, but if your, your heart is to know the word of God, I'm going to challenge you, get in it. So everything that I'm going to be referencing is right in there. Open your Bibles. We're in Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. And I want to I challenge you that today's passage is a critical passage. Similar to Acts chapter 10 when the Holy Spirit poured out his power on people who were not Jewish and how the gospel was being preached to Gentiles, those who were far from God. God made salvation available to everybody. He made the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit available to everybody. Acts chapter 10 was a critical passage. But so is Acts chapter 15. And today what we're looking at is an argument that erupted in the church about the condition of of salvation. What does it mean to be saved? What are the processes, the, the steps that it takes to be saved? What does the Bible say? And this debate exploded. So if you have your Bibles and you're ready to read or there's scripture on the screen, Acts chapter 15 verses 1 through 5, it says, some men came down from Judea and they began to teach the brothers that unless you are circumcised according to the customs prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this issue. And when they had been there and sent on their way to the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria. Sometimes words you don't understand, you just got to read them in confidence. <laughs> Describing in detail the conversation of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all the brothers and sisters. The Bagite book continues to say that when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles, and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the believers, I want you to catch this, some of the believers who belonged to the party of Pharisees, they stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to come and command them to keep the law of Moses. So what's going on here? Let's recap. There's a celebration. Paul and Barnabas, they're describing what God has been doing. God is saving people. God is healing people. God is not just limited salvation to Jews, but God is saying it's available to everybody. We're seeing people believe in Jesus. We're seeing people healed in Jesus. We're seeing people baptized by water and baptized by the Holy Spirit. This is a celebration. But somewhere in the church, people began to sit and rise up, and they started throwing stones at the power, at the work of what God was doing. Church, here's what I want to warn you. We've studied in the book of Acts that Satan came with persecution to try to stop and destroy the church. And what I'm seeing in this passage is if Satan can't break the church by outside pressure... 
If Satan can't break the church by outside forces, if Satan can't break the church through the government and through the passing of laws and through persecution, what Satan will do is begin to speak to men and women inside the church. He will raise them up to stir division, to stir challenges, to stir confusion at what God is doing. But God is looking to raise up people, men and women of God, children of God, who are called to holiness, who are called to purity, who are called to prayer, who are called to power. And whatever God does, Satan counterfeits. That's why as a church, one of our core values is we are united in purpose. We can disagree on certain issues, but at the end of the day, we're all called, we're chosen, we're called to come under the obedience of the word of God. I may understand it differently than you. We may have disagreements here and there, but what we agree on is that all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. What we agree on is that every single one of us are separated from a loving God. And that God in his love and in his judgment must judge the world. What we agree on is that Jesus came down, born of a virgin, died on the cross for the sins of humanity. What we agreed on that unless we believe in Jesus Christ, we will drink the wrath of God. What we agree on is there will become a day of final judgment and Christ is returning. These are core values of our church. Where we can disagree, does water baptism need to be fully immersed or is it sprinkled? Where we can disagree, is child dedication something for the kid or is it for the parent? Where we can disagree, do we have to use real wine or do we use grape juice in communion? You see, those are lesser issues, but the core of the gospel must remain. In today's argument, the people that rose up, they challenged, can these people really be saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone? And this is where we find ourselves. See, the group that Paul was arguing with, we have to understand, they were converted Jewish Christians from the strict Pharisaic group, which basically means they held the law of Moses at a very high regard, and that they were looking to marry. As they came to faith, they were marrying their strict religious views to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to be circumcised. You have to follow every law that was given in the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, every single one. And unless you follow it all, you're not really saved. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 16, it says that on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. You see, the challenge of this verse is many people in the Gentile Roman world were not circumcised. So for a child, no big deal. They're born, we take care of that, it's done. Try telling that to a 30-year-old man. See, all of you got a little bit uncomfortable. Ryan, welcome back. I'm going to give this part of the service to you. This is is your job. Have fun, buddy. (laughs) Just kidding. But it would have been really uncomfortable. A 30-year-old man, a 40-year-old man, what do you, what do you mean? In order to be saved, you, you have to take a knife down there? I don't know about this Jesus thing. Like, this is some serious level stuff here. But this was the argument that unless they are marked, unless they are separated, unless they are cut off there, they're not really saved. And it sounds crazy to us because we don't even think about this. But here's what I want you to see. We're going to look at three lessons from Acts chapter 15. Number one, sometimes we bring our own baggage into our faith. You see, for the Pharisees, it was circumcision. For us, it could be many different things. It could be playing cards. It could be smoking. It could be drinking. It could be eating pork. If we're vegans, it could be eating meat. For you non-loving, pasta-fearing people who worry about carbs, it could be eating pasta. Maybe, you're, maybe for you, it's watching R-rated movies that if you do that, man, you're not saved. Perhaps you're in a house that is adamantly against video games. You're adamantly against guns. You're adamantly against Disney. You know, for me growing up, my parents, those were not the issues of the day. For me growing up, it was Pokemon cards, Harry Potter, and secular music. If you indulged in any of those things, you, you were not following Jesus, that you were under the influence that it was of the devil. And I'm sorry my parents are here today. I honor you guys. I've grown up for many years being as your object lesson. It's time to turn it around. <laughs> Do 
You see, for my mom growing up in her time, you were not viewed as a real Christian if you went to the movie theater. In Bible college, we had many different rules we had to follow, and I'm going to tell you I'm a huge rule breaker. I'm a huge stickler, but when I think a rule is stupid, I'm a big rule breaker. And one of the rules that I got hit with, they actually gave me a fine, was if I left my dormitory in shorts to go to the gym on campus, then I was found causing my sisters to stumble. What a stupid rule. (laughs) You must wear blinders everywhere else you go in society. For one of my professors in college, I remember he gave a lecture and he talked about church customs and and history. And he said that when he grew up as a child, it was looked as you were a sinful Christian. You were a backsliding Christian if you went to a high school baseball game. What I'm trying to show you is that every culture, every generation has its own baggage that they bring into the faith. We love Jesus. We want to honor Jesus with our lives. But what we tend to do is act just like the Pharisees and create circles and cages where God has given us freedom and liberty. We draw circles around our kids. We draw circles around our parenting. And it's not, I want to tell you, it's not bad having guidelines. It's not bad having family values. It's not bad having rules. But what is wrong is using the Bible and using Jesus as your justification and reason to draw cages and draw circles where the Bible has remained silent. Using Jesus as your reason for kids not going to theaters. Using Jesus as your reason for not allowing sleepovers. Using Jesus as your reason for not allowing Disney. Using Jesus as your reason for not allowing video games. Using Jesus as your reason for not taking the medication that you need. Using Jesus as your reason for banning Netflix. Using Jesus as your reason for not allowing secular music in your house. Using Jesus as your reason for not going to counseling is wrong. See, what happens is your kids will grow up under submission, but once they hit an age of maturity and they begin to understand the Bible, they'll see that there's holes in your teaching. There's holes in the theology. That God's word doesn't necessarily ban some of these things. Mom and dad were banning some of these things. And I want to restate this so you hear this. It is not bad for mom and dad to have rules in their household. But what is wrong is trying to manipulate your children and saying God's word says when God's word has never said. It's okay to say we will not be a family that supports Disney because of X, Y, and Z. But leave it at that. It's okay to say as a family, hey, we're not going to go over to that person's house. It's okay as a family to say we're not going to entertain this type of music. But do not create bondage and cages where God has been silent. In our attempt to control outcomes, we often breed rebellion. You see, children, when they grow up and they realize that that mom and dad were over-controlling and restricting and limiting, and they use the Bible as their word for that, they often rebel and run far from God. The fact of the matter is Jesus plus anything equals ruin. Jesus plus circumcision equals ruin. Jesus plus anything equals ruin. And this is an uncomfortable passage because many denominations, the assemblies of God included, have built cages around issues that Jesus didn't say was an issue. Jesus plus anything equals ruin. And I'm going to say this one more time so nobody can misquote me. I'm not saying parents don't have a right to have rules in their house. I'm just saying set the standard on the rules you've created. Yes, we love the Bible. Your church family is going to support you. Your church family is going to encourage you. But don't teach Jesus that he says no to something when he's been silent. You see, when we try to add on to the gospel, we try to create rules for control and claim biblical authority. And kids grow up and see God as a great limiter and not a great redeemer. They understand, doing this, they told me don't put my hand at the bottom of the mic. (laughs) They see God as a great limiter and not a great redeemer. God is about all the no's and what I shouldn't do instead of the open garden that God gave Adam and Eve at the very beginning. God is a great redeemer. He's not a great limiter. 
So I can't touch on issues of parenting and not give you specifics about what the Bible does teach us. So a real quick sub point, we're going to look at seven parenting principles from the Bible. So if you have your notes, look there. You can look on the screen. But the first thing I want to show you is number one, your child is a blessing from the Lord. If we look at Psalms chapter 127 verses 3 through 5, the Bible says this. That sons are indeed an heritage from the Lord, an offspring, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons born to people in their youth. Happy is the man who is filled with the quiver of their children. The world today says children are a burden. The world today says children are a mistake. The world today calls children a financial pressure and and we're overpopulated and we just need to stop having children in the world. But the Bible declares if you have a family, if you're serving the Lord, if you're hungry after God and the Lord blesses you with children, they're a blessing. You see, what the world calls a burden, God called a blessing. There's days that your children may be burdens there may be days your children are a pain in the butt if we can just keep it real but those are seldom children are seldom a burden but they're always a blessing that's what God says so I want to start challenging you church change the way you speak over your children declare hope declare healing declare blessing declare future declare purpose declare promise speak life and not death Too often we're like the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. We look at hardship and all we can do is talk about this hardship. And what happens? They stay stuck there. They stay bound there. They stay circled around there. Instead of speaking about your children and the difficulties that you may be facing today, begin to declare God's word over them. That you will grow to serve the Lord. That you will walk in honor. That you will walk in respect. That God has called purpose and destiny and future over you. And I declare that in Jesus' name. Your children are a blessing from the Lord. Number two, seven principles that the Bible teaches about parenting. Your children are a blessing. Number two, your child is your responsibility. Mom and dad, I want you to hear this. Schools, churches, and governments do not have the right to raise your kids. God has given you the responsibility as a parent to raise your child, to know him, to love him, to fear him, to walk with him. And one of the things that we've done as a society and in churches as well is we've transferred the responsibility of parenting to organizations. There was a church that I preached in before, and one of the things they would just say in the, in the board meetings was, well, if we could just hire the right youth pastor, if we could just hire the right children's worker, if we could just vote the right person into office, then my children will change. No, the Bible does not give the government, the church, or your school system the right to raise your children. I want to challenge you, church. Be involved. Know what your child is reading. Know what your child is learning. Know what your child is believing. Be involved in their spiritual growth and development. Teach your kids to pray. Teach your kids to serve. Teach your kids to honor God. Teach your kids to honor authority. Teach your kids to honor government. Teach your kids to honor police officers. Teach your kids to show respect. If you have the app, you can go ahead and look at the, there's verses that I've given for every single point. I don't have the time to go over every single one of them, but please look at them, study them, read them, know where this is coming from. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7, the summary of that says, teach your children God's word. This is a challenge to men. Teach your children God's word. Talk about it in every opportunity that you get. Whether you're at their dinner table, whether you're driving in the car, whether you're at the sports game, find opportunities To teach them the word. Number three, what does the Bible say about parenting? Number three, the point of parenting is godliness. The point of parenting is godliness. The goal is not to just raise obedient children, but to raise God-loving and honoring kids. You can raise a moral kid that still goes to hell. I want you to hear this. My best friend, he's, he's, he grew up in church. His family was ministers in the same community that we lived in. They were children's pastors. They preached the gospel. He's not following the Lord. 
For years, he's not following the Lord. And he just started making a decision that, well, maybe I need to go to church, not because I believe in any of this stuff, but it provides good moral upbringing. And praise God, God can use that. That can use that as a starting point to get him in and begin to speak to him. But I want to tell you, church, that our goal is not right moral upbringing. Our goal is godliness. Our goal is to honor the Lord. Our goal is to surrender to the Lord. Our goal is to bring up a generation that knows who God is, that knows he's faithful, that knows he's a redeemer, that knows he's a healer, that he baptizes people with fire and passion and holiness, that God calls us to be different than the rest of the world, that there is a heaven, that there is a hell, that there is an eternity, and unless the gospel is preached, unless the God's church serves, unless God's church be the salt and the light of the earth, People are going to hell. Our goal is not to raise kids and just to help them marry the right spouse and get the good job, but it's leading them into eternity with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul teaches that family is your first ministry. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Paul writes this to future leaders of the church, and he says this, that a deacon, let me break that down, a deacon basically means a servant. A deacon in the church, a servant in the church, he must be faithful to his wife. He must manage his children and household well. The Bible continues to teach that if a deacon cannot do these things, he's disqualified from ministry. If you can't manage your own household, if you can't manage your children, if you can't be faithful to your wife, if you can't walk as a family in obedience to God, that disqualifies you. These are heavy words. Number four, the Bible teaches that your children start with a sinful nature and no theology. You see, when your children are born, they're not born as angels. They're not born as Christians. They're not born perfect. They're born with a sinful nature separated from God. They have no understanding of theology. They have no understanding of the Bible. They don't know who God is. They don't know what it means to have a relationship with the Lord. They don't know how to read the Bible or how to press in and get into God's presence and really just pull on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They don't understand how to hear God's voice. So parents, it's your job, it's your responsibility to train the children to know and love Jesus. It's your responsibility to model godliness. It's your responsibility to engage them with the word at home. It's your responsibility to bring your children and your families into prayer and soak in the presence of God. Kids need oral instruction. They need to be taught, but they need to be shown. That's one of the reasons why we have family worship. It's so important that kids come in. As a previous children's pastor here at Morningstar, it's so important that kids come into service and see mom and dad worshiping Jesus together. I know in the parent brain it might be, oh, this is an interruption. This is a distraction. I got to keep them busy and I got to give them a coloring. Don't do that. Don't distract them. Don't give them a coloring sheet. Let them worship with you. Let them praise God with you. Let them come to church with you. We give children screens enough. We give children distraction enough. And sometimes, I get it, life is busy. You get home from work, you're tired. We don't always knock it out of the park. But if you have the opportunity to bring your kids to church, don't distract them. Let them engage With you. God places the responsibility of parenting children on the home. He doesn't give it to the government. He doesn't give it to the schools. He doesn't even give it to your church or your pastor. The church serves as a good protein shake to an already healthy diet. If your diet is bad all week long, it doesn't matter what message is being preached here. It doesn't matter what worship service is like here. Because you're going to go back into Monday and start eating junk food again. You have to be healthy all week long. Your children need to see you healthy all week long. The Bible says the actual responsibility of the pastor is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Equipping parents to raise their children. Equipping the church to go and be the light in this community. Equipping businesses to represent Jesus well in their conduct. But God puts the responsibility of parenting on the home. So I want to do a quick plug-in. Maybe you're here today and you're like, you know what? I don't know what it's like to do that. Maybe I'm not confident to pray with my kids yet or lead a Bible study at home or I I just don't know how to do it. I'm new to this thing. I want to tell you that's okay. 
This fall, we have two different marriage groups that are starting up to strengthen you and equip you. Caleb and Rachel, if you guys raise your hand real quick, I know it's dark. They're leaving a, leading a group here, love and respect. It's all about building unity in your relationship. How do we strengthen our marriage so that way we can leave a destiny, a generation, and a purpose for our family? In our Quaker Town campus, we're looking at you and me forever. How do we align our marriage? Maybe we don't need the strengthening right now, but how do I align my marriage to fulfill God's call on my marriage. God has called not just you, but he's called you and your spouse to a specific task and to a specific purpose. You and me forever. We're driven by eternity. We understand that marriage is, a good marriage is not the ultimate goal, but a good marriage is helping lead my wife into eternity. It's helping to encourage my husband to walk into eternity and to bring our children into eternity with us. We also have two different parenting groups that will help engage your children and support your children in parenting. If you got the slide on the screen, Laura Gaines is an author and speaker, and she's got a book coming out in the fall, and she's agreed to do a book study in the fall to train your children to know and love the Lord. Unshakable kids. How do I give them a faith that this culture cannot shake? Number two, if you got the other side, please. As I mentioned, we have two different connect groups coming for marriages, and we're also promoting the event by Focus on the Family, a weekend to remember. If you are in need of growing in your relationship with one another, if there maybe there's some things you need to work on, I want to encourage you, sign up for that event. Go to that event. It's going to challenge you. Focus on the Family, their whole purpose is to strengthen your family with the Word of God. There's going to be things they have you dive into and work on, and it is beautiful, and it is powerful. And when Jennifer and I first got married, somebody blessed us in a church in North Carolina and sent us to that. That event that has left an impression on our marriage and I'd, I'd love for every single person to sign up and get involved in there because God does a great work at that conference number five the Bible teaches that your children are vulnerable so you have to protect them you see, when your kids are little and young, they get hurt and they do stupid things. Little Johnny, he's like, well, I want to put the fork in the electric socket. And you keep telling him, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. You're going to get hurt. And maybe you're tempted to say, all right, just go ahead and do it and figure it out. I'm just kidding. Don't quote me on that one. <laughs> But as your kids get older, they need less helicopter parenting, less, less answers here and there, and they just need you to support them. Teens navigate a whole lot of stuff that this generation that we never had to deal with. Am I, am I gay? Am I straight? Am I a boy? Am I a girl? Where am I looking at? What am I supposed to be at? What am I, how am I getting a job? Where am I supposed to be in my dating life? And you're just supposed to be there to help them through that process. Number six, because I'm falling short on time. The Holy Spirit knows your child better than you do and will help you raise them. You do not have to do this thing alone. I want to encourage you, tap into God. Tap into his presence. Tap into prayer. The Bible teaches that he formed your child in the very womb of the mother. He knows them intimately. The Bible declares he knows every single hair on your head. God knows you. He loves you. He knows your children, and he loves your children. And nobody wants to see them go to heaven more than the Holy Spirit. So partner with him in prayer. Number seven, the Bible teaches love your child and work towards enjoying each other. You see, love is constant. It's not conditional. I don't love my child. You can't love your child based on their performance because one day they're just not able to perform. Love is unconditional. Love is generous. Love is self-sacrificing. I want to encourage you, make memories, have fun with your children because your time is limited. Enjoy the phase of life that God has given you. Amen? All right, I got to get back on track. I got 11 minutes. I can do this. Three things we learned from Acts chapter 15. Number one, sometimes we bring our own baggage into our faith. Number two, we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. The importance of the Jerusalem Council was to determine what was the line being drawn, what was the condition for salvation. And this argument was so heated, this argument was so passionate because people genuinely wanted to honor God's word. Do we need to obey every single law or is Jesus enough? And church, today we have the benefit of knowing and understanding and living past this council meeting argument. We know that faith in Jesus Christ is alone. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, Paul writes this, For it is by grace that you have been saved. 
It's through faith. It's not from yourself. It's a gift from God. It's not by works so that no man can boast. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that mankind can be saved. John 14.6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Titus 3.5 says, He saved us not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. It's not what I did. It's not who I am. It's not what I can accomplish for his kingdom, but it's God's mercy that you're here. That's why Jesus tells us we need to lead with love. You see, God told us in the scriptures that the God of this world, he's referring to Satan, has blinded people. Our job is not to get mad with people who disagree with us. Our job is not to get mad at those who would challenge the word of God. Our job is to love them and pray for them and declare truth regardless of what happens. The Bible teaches they've been blinded. They're held in captivity. But because of God's grace, you're not in their position. Acts 16, verse 30 through 1, it says, He then brought them out and asked them, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you and your whole household will be saved. I'm going to jump down to Romans 10, 10. It says, For it is within your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. We are saved by faith alone. There's nothing I can do to earn God's grace. There's nothing I can do to earn salvation. We are saved by his mercy alone. That leads us into our last point. Saved people serve people. You see, saved people serve people. Saved people are involved in their local church Paul writes in Philippians 2.12, he says, Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. The church is the only place you're going to go in this world that is going to preach the gospel unapologetically. It is the only place that you're going to find that where we open the word of God, we're going to see truth, and we're going to preach it to the best of our ability. I've heard some people use the excuse, well, I don't serve at church because I serve at my job, and I want to tell you that's a bunch of bunk. You cannot serve at your job because at your job they're paying you for your work. Right? I go in, I punch in, I get paid. As a pastor, I come in and I get paid for the work that I do in the office. All staff are required to go beyond the office hours, to go beyond the 40 hours a week and go higher and serve in their local church. We're not an exception. God has called every single Christian to serve. And the Bible, te- well, the Bible, the Bible teaches that we are the body of Christ. And if I can use this analogy, a body that is not in motion is dying. A body that refuses to move, a body that becomes lethargic, a body that is sitting on the couch all day begins to eat its own muscle tissue away. It begins to starve itself. It begins to eat itself. It becomes weak. If cells are not in motion, cells die. And I want to tell you, church, that when a Christian stops serving, that when a Christian pulls away from the body of Christ, they begin to shrivel up and die spiritually. God has placed you here for a reason. He's gifted you for a reason. He's encouraged you for a reason. He saved you for a reason. Not so you can sit on the couch and and sit in glory one day, but God wants to use you, to equip you, to bless you, to take the gospel to this world. Billy Graham said it like this, that the highest form of worship is the worship of unselfish Christian service. And the greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet, seeking out the lost and the helpless. Charles Spurgeon said it like this, that I believe that many professing Christians are cold and uncomfortable because they're doing nothing for the Lord. But if they actively served them, the blood would begin to circulate again. Their spiritual life would begin to move again. They'd begin to hear the voice of God because they've activated a dead body. St. Francis of DeSales said it this way, that great occasion for serving God comes seldom, but little ones surround us daily. In closing, I want you to hear this, that the heart of the gospel is this. We are saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ, but it's because of our faith and love for Jesus Christ that we serve others. 
The big idea is this, that God has saved me. He has called me to fulfill his perfect plan for my life. And when I don't know what to do next, when I'm waiting for God and I have confusion and I don't have answers and I'm searching him, when I'm waiting for God to speak for that next stage in my life, we're going to do what waiters do. We're going to serve. There are no passive Christians. You see, if the church was passive in the book of Acts, if the church was not active in the book of Acts, then the gospel would stop going forward. We are always one generation away from losing everything God has trusted us with. God has saved us. He's called us to service and ministry. Amen. Worship team, come on up. We, we're going to take a moment. I want to just give some instruction. Because this, this is a huge portion in the book of Acts. I want to make sure that this is clear. We're not saved by our works, but because we're saved, we go to work. We're not saved by the things that we do or great sermons that we preach or great or amounts of money that we give or volunteer. Those things will not save us. Moral kids will go to hell. Moral adults will go to hell. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. So the worship team is going to lead us in, in one last song, and, and it's a powerful song because it's a prayer. And the song simply goes like this, I give myself away. I give myself away so that you can use me. My life is not my own. My plans, my purposes, my dreams, my hopes, my future, the house I want, the job I want, the lifestyle I want, it's not my own. But I trust it and I give it and I put it in your hands. And you know what, church? We serve a good God. Jesus says, seek the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. God doesn't promise you poverty. But he promises you to take, that he'd take care of you. And when the church is willing to give itself away, when the body of Christ is willing to give itself away, when the church says, I'm here, I'm going to respond to the call of God, that he's called me to activation, that he's called me to service, and I may not be doing something right now, but I'm open, Lord, I'm willing, use me. I give myself away. God will begin to do the miraculous in this place, in this community, and in this nation. And I believe, church, the reason why America is the way it is is because for too long the church has sat idle in pews. They've sat passive. And as Pastor Ryan has often said, our job is not to be keepers of the aquarium, but to be fishers of men. So, Lord, we give ourselves the way. As we get ready to come into this song, Lord, I pray for your body. I pray for your church. That we would be humble. That we would be open. That we would be usable by you. So if that's you today, we're going we're gonna to start singing the song. We're going to open the altars if you need to pray. And the prayer team can come up if you, you're needing prayer. But we have a practical step. Outside the booth right now, in the foyer, there's a table with serving cards. It represents every need that this campus has. We're lacking children's workers. We're lacking youth workers. We're lacking people who will show up and serve on a Sunday and help prepare coffee and help do these things. I'm not ashamed to say it. The body of Christ needs to be activated. So, Lord, I give myself away for you to use me. As we go into this last song and the Holy Spirit speaks to you, come and pray at the altar. Go and check out the table out there. We're going to have a great time of fellowship and tailgating, but let's use the last few moments to humbly come before our God in Jesus' name.